Let me ask, maybe it's looking at gift horse in the mouth. Why is this economy so strong and why did so many of us, I'm not saying you, but so many of us not get it? Were you actually a little bit surprised it's this strong? Look, we have had a battle between fiscal and monetary policy. Fiscal policy has been expansionary and I'm not just talking about 2020 and 2021. Last year it was really expansionary again too. Monetary policy has been contracting things and you see that playing out with strong consumer spending which the fiscal policy has been helping outweighing weak categories like residential investment, which have been held down by monetary policy. And Jason, where would I look for the pockets of weakness? I mean, you think about how many rate hikes that we've seen from the Fed, over 500 basis points or so. It really feels like it hasn't put a damper on the labor market, on inflation. Of course, yes, we've cooled quite a lot. But where are we seeing the effects of those much higher interest rates? Look, I think residential investment was, you know, just really hit hard initially. Um, it's plateaued, but plateaued at a lower value. Um, a lot of the other categories of interest sensitive investment, like equipment investment, also has performed quite weakly. So I think that whole category of GDP, then if you look in the labor market, um, hours have been trending down. I'm not talking about that big fall in January, which might have been spurious but you know what we've seen over the last year and a half so you know there's been some weakness too on balance of course the strengths have outweighed the weaknesses well, well so let me take the other side of that from what katie's saying she's talking about the weaknesses let me talk about the next strengths what's going to give the economy the next push if it comes i mean i've learned from economists like you it's either having more workers or more productivity where is it going to come from Look, we don't have a whole lot more workers. We keep surprising me um, with the amount that labor force participation can rise. But, you know, you look over the last year and the employment rate for prime age workers has basically plateaued. Um, far and away, the most important thing is productivity growth. That is also far and away the hardest thing um, to understand and forecast. Well, when it comes to uh, productivity growth, you write in your notes that the productivity boom is massively overstated, massively in all caps there. What do you make of the argument, though, that we could see artificial intelligence contribute to productivity in the same way, a similar way that the Internet did in the 90s, early 2000s or so? Yeah, let's distinguish between two different things. One, what are we seeing in the macro data? There's some people that are saying, hey, over the last year, productivity is up 2.7%. That's really high. That's the beginning of a boom. Well, the problem is that a year ago, productivity was down 2.0%. And so over the last two years, productivity growth has been quite uh, weak. It's a volatile thing. It bounces around. So I think anyone touting those great productivity numbers, unless a year ago they were fretting about productivity, is probably just overly optimistic. There's then you actually, you know, talk to people, read the newspaper, go on the internet yourself. Generative AI is amazing. I think at some point it will show up um, in the productivity data, but I don't think it's there yet. And I don't think I would count on it being there in the next one or two years, which is the time horizon that's relevant for the Fed and its monetary policy. Jason, as you know, here at Bloomberg, we spend a lot of time talking about the Fed, what it will or will not do, and there's a lot of speculation about rate cuts. I guess my question for you as an economist is, what impetus is there to cut rates right now for the Federal Reserve? And what is in the economic data that would say they need to? We've got growth, we've got strong jobs. Why do they need to cut? Um, first of all, David, inflation's around 2%. Second of all, it's really important to remember that with rates at 5.25, they're really restrictive. If they cut rates, they'll still be very restrictive, just not very, very restrictive. And the mistake that the Fed made in 2021 was they thought that lifting off was contractionary. It wasn't. At first, it was just shifting from you know, more expansionary to somewhat less expansionary. It's the same thing now in reverse. We're not talking about putting the pedal on the gas. We're just talking about easing up on the brake a little bit. And in a world where monetary policy operates with a lag and where rates really are quite high right now, um, I think that makes sense to do sooner rather than later. Let's talk about the magnitude of rate cuts needed to get out of restricted territory, because there's anywhere from three to six rate cuts priced in for 2024, depending on what day you look at. It feels like this market can turn on a dime. But if the goal is to just get out of restrictive, get back to neutral territory, what magnitude of rate cuts is needed to do that? 
you know, they don't know. It's a process of exploration. They're going to have to do a little bit, see the data, do a little bit more. Um, unfortunately, when data is noisy and data has lags, that's a lot easier said um, than done. You know, my guess is they start, you know, if, if they started in May, cut rates every other meeting, I think they'd have a lot more information on this at the end of the year. Um, I think the neutral rate is probably something in nominal terms around 3%. 3.25%, but I don't think they should be in a hurry to get themselves to neutral, um, but they should be in a, uh, not take too long to get started on moving in that direction and learning more in the process. Uh, Jason, I'm going to push you here a little bit. You're an economist, not a sociologist, but I wonder why, given the strength of the economy, the American people don't seem to believe it's that good an economy. You see poll after poll after poll basically saying, we're not sure about this economy, we don't feel good about it, and by the way, we don't trust President Biden in his handling of it. Do you have any thoughts about why that is? Look, there's some basis for negativity, which is over the last three years, um, real wages have done quite badly. You've seen price growth outstripping wage growth over that period of time. Um, that being said, the levels of sentiment are more like deep recession levels than sort of mildly pessimistic levels. I think a lot of that is unrelated to the economy. Some of that is partisan polarization. But the important thing is it actually is getting better. Consumer sentiment has gotten a lot better in the last couple of months. It hasn't showed up in the president's approval ratings. But who knows? Maybe these things happen with long and variable lags. Well, Jason, when it comes to that dour sentiment, of course, some people have advanced the theory that it's because of the outright level of prices. Of course, the pace of inflation has slowed, but the level of prices are much, much higher than they have been, you know, going back quite a while. I mean, what do you make of that argument? And if that's the case, do we need outright deflation to really boost sentiment here? Right. So on the levels, I think in some ways that's just like thinking of the inflation rate over a longer period of time. So rather than people measuring inflation over one year, they're measuring it over the unit of time I said before, something like three years. And prices are up, I can't remember, 20 percent or something over the last three years. Um, wage growth has been higher than normal, too. But yes, price growth has outstripped wage growth over that longer period of time. I think people are looking at that. I think that's part of the pessimism, but it's still not enough to explain as much pessimism um, as we see. And then in terms of deflation, um, it's not going to happen unless we have a catastrophic recession. So at some point, people will get used to this price level. I hope at some point wages will fully catch up with prices, and that's why they get used to it. But deflation is just not um, an economic policy option.